All right, well, welcome back. The last video, the first part of chapter 22, we talked about the anatomy of the lungs, and this time we're going to talk about the physiology of the lungs. So we're going to focus on gas exchange. Um, so the good news is this one should be a little bit shorter than the last one, certainly under an hour. So we'll get right into it. So remember that gas exchange, um, we talked about that in terms of respiration. So it is the movement of oxygen from the air that we breathe in into the bloodstream, this is at the, at the lungs, and the movement of carbon dioxide out of the bloodstream and into the air that we've breathed in, and then that we expire or expel, breathe out um, to get rid of that carbon dioxide. So in order to oxygenate the blood, that's gonna depend on two things. So you can see there the body supply of oxygen depends on its concentration and pressure in ambient air. Well, so if we've got those two factors. One of the things to know is that the concentration of oxygen is fairly constant. So you can see in the air that we breathe in, in ambient air, that oxygen takes up a little bit less than 21% of that air, so 20.93% and that the vast majority of that air is nitrogen. And then the remainder is carbon dioxide, water vapor, and a number of other, um, another, number of other gases in really small concentrations. So if concentration of oxygen in the air that we breathe in stays relatively consistent, then one of the things that does change is the pressure of that oxygen. So uh, a few things to throw out here. So one of the ways to think about pressure. So here I'm going to use the term atmospheric pressure, but you'll also see barometric pressure. They're basically interchangeable for our purposes. But that pressure is the weight of the atmosphere pushing down on you. So one of the ways to think about that is if you had a column of air that runs from the top of your head all the way to the very top of the atmosphere, that air has weight, not very much weight, but it does have some. So the pressure of air at sea level is it's all of it's measured in millimeters of mercury so the pressure of air at sea level is 760 millimeters of mercury so put into a number that makes a little bit more sense that is 14.7 pounds per square inch so that's the weight of a column of air directly over your head all the way to the top of the atmosphere and so where that pressure changes is if we change our elevation. So if we move from sea level to Denver, so Denver, the mile high city, is around 5,200 feet in elevation, so about 5,200 feet above sea level. And so the air pressure in Denver goes from 760 at sea level. In Denver, it is 631 millimeters of mercury. So the pressure, the atmospheric pressure has dropped quite a bit. Again, because as you go up in elevation, well, then there's simply less air above you. There's less between you and the top of the atmosphere because you've gone up pretty significantly in elevation. You've gone up a mile in that case. And so whereas the weight of the atmosphere at sea level is 14.7 pounds per square inch, in Denver, it's only 12.2 pounds per square inch. So we've lost two and a half pounds there. And so because of that, because of that reduction in pressure, there's not as much of a driving force pushing oxygen into the bloodstream. And so with that reduction in pressure, then we can see a little bit of a reduction in oxygenation of the blood. So um, there's a couple different concepts on there as well. So you've got partial pressure, so the number that I was giving you a second ago, so 760 millimeters of mercury, that's again the uh, atmospheric pressure at sea level, um, that pressure, that atmospheric pressure is combined of the mixture of all of those gases. So 20% oxygen, almost 80% nitrogen, and then the remainder, right? And so the concept of partial pressure is how much each gas contributes to that total. So par partial pressure, the definition is, the pressure that one component of a mixture of gases would exert if it were alone in a container. So if we take the total pressure, so 760 millimeters of mercury, and we multiply it by uh, 0 0.2093, because again, oxygen is 20% of that total pressure, that number, so if we multiply the whole 760 by 20.93%, that's gonna give us oxygen's partial pressure. So what percentage of the total pressure is contributed by oxygen. So if we math that out, 760 times 0.2093, we end up with 159 millimeters of mercury. 
So oxygen's partial pressure, and you're going to see that number as a capital PO2. That's the partial pressure of oxygen. So at sea level, its partial pressure, oxygen's partial pressure, is 159 millimeters of mercury. So that's when we breathe it in. But as you breathe the air in, we talked about last time in terms of the anatomy of the respiratory tract and of the lungs, that one of the first things that we do when we breathe in is to warm the air and humidify the air. So as you add additional water vapor to the air, that actually changes the concentration of the air that we've breathed in a little bit. So because you've added some water to it, that displaces some of the oxygen. So because you get a change in concentration, that then affects the pressure. And so what that means from a practical standpoint is the partial pressure of oxygen drops from 159 when we breathe it in, and again, we're talking millimeters of mercury here, to 149 af after we've warmed and humidified the air. So then once it, the air that we breathe in finally makes it down into the alveoli, then the concentration of oxygen is going to change even more. So as we move into the alveolar air, you're going to get a higher concentration than normal of carbon dioxide, because again, we're expelling carbon dioxide as a byproduct of energy production. And so because of that higher concentration of carbon dioxide, specifically in that alveolar air, it's about five and a half percent carbon dioxide as opposed to 0.03 percent in ambient air. The pressure of um, oxygen, the partial pressure of oxygen is going to drop again to about 100 millimeters of mercury. So by the time that the oxygen finally makes it down into the alveolus, which is where we're going to um, absorb it, where it's going to move from the air that we breathed in into the bloodstream, the partial pressure of oxygen has dropped down to about 100 millimeters of mercury. So in the air that we breathe in, uh, in our ambient air, concentration of oxygen stays approximately the same. Pressure changes depending upon elevation, so pressure drops as your elevation goes up, because again you're getting closer to the top of the atmosphere, so pressure de uh, decreases. And then once you breathe the air in, then we're going to start to get some changes in concentration as we add water and as we add carbon dioxide to the air that we breathe in, as it, as it mixes um, with the, the air that's still in our lungs. All right, so that's everything on this slide. So then let's talk about Henry's Law. So Henry's Law, you can see the important part there is that gases diffuse in proportion to their partial pressure. And more specifically, the important part about that is that gases diffuse from high pressure to low pressure, which makes sense because we talked about things um, like sodium moving from an area of high concentration to low works the same basic way with gases. They move from high, high pressure to low pressure. And how quickly that diffusion occurs depends upon those two factors that you see below. So the diffusion rate depends upon the pressure differential. So the greater the pressure differential, the faster the diffusion is going to take place. The smaller the pressure differential, then the slower that diffusion is going to take place. And then the second factor on there is the solubility. So oxygen is not particularly soluble in blood plasma. Um, carbon dioxide is. And so because oxygen is not particularly soluble, that is one of the reasons that we have to transport it bound to hemoglobin. Um, carbon dioxide, what we do, and we won't get into this, but in your later classes you might, um, carbon dioxide is actually going to enter the red blood cells, and then after that series of chemical reactions, but it, it ends up being bicarbonate. Um, and so that's how we transport most of the carbon dioxide in the blood, but you also do transport some free carbon dioxide in the blood as well. So where some of this stuff is going to matter is as that pressure goes down, or if that pressure goes down, there's less of a driving force pushing that gas into the blood. So if the pressure of oxygen goes down, there's less of a driving force, and so then we get decreased oxygenation of the blood. Same concept the other way. If we get an increase in pressure of carbon dioxide, which we would um, during exercise, the muscle cells are going to produce lots of carbon dioxide as a byproduct of ATP production. And so as they do that, the pressure of carbon dioxide in the muscle goes up, and then that creates a really big driving force pushing it from the muscle into the bloodstream. At rest, that pressure differential isn't as great, so there's not as big of a driving force pushing it into the bloodstream. All right. So then, you can see that the exchange of gases between the lungs and blood uh, is dependent upon pressure gradients, which is kind of what we've been talking about this whole time. 
So this is a picture um, that you saw on the earlier portion of the slideshow. So you've got a single alveolus and then the capillary adjacent to it. And so what you've got there, the erythrocyte again is a red blood cell. So you've got the oxygen moving into the red blood cell, the carbon dioxide moving into the alveolar air so that we can breathe it out. So this graphic is a good one, but I think it throws people off in terms of what they're looking at a lot of the time. So in terms of what you've got here, so this is a single alveolus. So this is one of those little air sacs where we're going to get respiration, where we're going to get gas exchange. And so it also includes what I described to you earlier. So in the air that we breathe in, the partial pressure of oxygen, again, capital PO2, is 159 millimeters of mercury. As we breathe the air in, warm it and humidify it, it drops to 149. And then as we move into that alveolar air, it drops to 100 millimeters of mercury in part due to that higher concentration of carbon dioxide in that air. All right, and so then the other structures you've got here, so you've got your pulmonary capillary, the blood vessel that's passing by our little alveolus. So on the left side over here, this is your deoxygenated blood. And then on the right side, this is your freshly oxygenated blood. So after it, it goes past the alveolus, it's going to pick up oxygen and drop off carbon dioxide. So then that becomes the arterial blood. And so we'll actually start, uh, let's start down here with the muscle. All right, so the muscle is going to have a, a relatively high pressure of, or partial pressure, sorry, of carbon dioxide. So that's your PCO2. So the pressure there is 46 millimeters of mercury. The partial pressure of carbon dioxide in the arterial blood is only 40. And so because gas is moved from high pressure to low pressure, there's more pressure in the muscle than there is in the capillary. That's going to push carbon dioxide from the muscle into the capillary. And so once that blood has passed our working muscle, actually this would be a muscle arrest, but once it's passed its muscle cell, um, then the partial pressure of carbon dioxide jumps up to what it was in the muscle, so 46 millimeters of mercury. So then that blood circulates to the lungs. Once we get to the alveolus, so the partial pressure of carbon dioxide in venous blood is still 46 millimeters of mercury. In the alveolar air, it's only 40 millimeters of mercury. And so that's going to then push carbon dioxide from high pressure to low. So it, it uh, forces carbon dioxide based on that pressure gradient out of the blood and into that alveolar air. All right. Well, in our returning venous blood, the partial pressure of oxygen is only 40 millimeters of mercury that you can see there. In the air that we breathe in, it's 100 millimeters, right? And we talked about how we got there. So then that's going to force oxygen into, again, moving from high pressure to low, into that capillary until we reach equilibrium. And so then in the arterial blood, the partial pressure of oxygen jumps up to 100 millimeters of mercury. We circulate this fully oxygenated blood down to the working muscle. Its partial pressure of oxygen is only 40 millimeters of mercury, and so now oxygen goes the other way. It goes from high pressure in the blood to low pressure in the muscle until we reach equilibrium. So we drop it down to 40, and then keep recirculating and the same thing keeps happening over and over and over again. So gases then, both carbon dioxide and oxygen are gonna, move, are gonna move from high pressure to low pressure. Trying to make sure there wasn't anything else in my notes I wanna talk about. Not really. Um, all right, so that's the way it's gonna work. So again, there's a little alveolus, oxygen moves into the blood goes to the muscle, drop oxygen off at the muscle, pick up carbon dioxide, come back to the alveolus, drop off carbon dioxide, pick up oxygen. That's the, the basic process here in terms of gas exchange. All right, so what we just covered is related to an important topic called ABO2 difference or arteriovenous oxygen difference. And so this is actually something we talked about with the heart chapter. And where I brought it up was in relation to heart attacks, that if somebody has significant atherosclerosis in their heart, that um, because the myocardial cells take out 80% of the oxygen that they see at rest, the only way to get more oxygen to those myocardial cells, or almost the only way, is to increase blood flow. So they can increase the AVO2 difference a little bit, um, up to 100%, but not, not very much. They don't have a lot of wiggle room there. So AVO2 difference describes the oxygen content of arterial blood as opposed to the oxygen content of venous blood. So AV stands for 
arterio venous. So it's the difference in oxygen content of arterial versus venous blood. And so what that really evaluates is how much oxygen is being extracted from the blood that passes a specific tissue. So in the case of muscles at rest, they only take out about 25% of the oxygen that they see. And so here I'm referring to skeletal muscles. So skeletal muscles during exercise then, one of the ways that we can get more oxygen to those skeletal muscles is to extract more of the oxygen that they see. So they can extract almost 100% of the oxygen that they see at rest. And so the AVO2 difference can go from 25% at rest to more like 100% during really intense exercise. You can, you can extract more oxygen from the blood because they are working um, at a higher intensity. They're, they're producing more ATP, so they need more oxygen to do it. So that's what the AVO2 difference is. It's essentially a measure of the metabolic act or a way to measure the metabolic activity of a cell. With the Bohr effect, so the Bohr effect describes hemoglobin's affinity for oxygen. How much does it like oxygen? How tightly is it bound to it? And so what you've got here is um, a picture of the Bohr effect. It's the oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve, and that is effectively how easily does hemoglobin give up its oxygen. And so one of the things that you're going to see here is that, so on this top chart we've got different temperatures so 10 degrees celsius as opposed to 43 degrees celsius um, and what this is showing you is that the higher the temperature the more easily hemoglobin gives up its oxygen so increased temperature allows offloading of oxygen from hemoglobin more easily so effectively it allows the the hemoglobin to deliver tissue to the oxygen to give it up um, sorry to deliver oxygen to the tissue to, to give up that oxygen more easily. And then the same kind of thing on the chart here in the lower right. So high acidity allows easier dissociation, allows hemoglobin to more easily give up its oxygen if the acidity is high. So increased temperature or increased acidity, decrease hemoglobin, that's the HB, decrease hemoglobin's affinity for oxygen. So why does that matter? Well. What that means from a practical standpoint is under the conditions of exercise where our core temperature is gonna go up because remember a byproduct of ATP breakdown is heat. So core temperature is gonna go up and the working muscles, at least initially, are not gonna get enough oxygen delivered to them and so they're gonna produce some energy anaerobically and so then that's gonna result in acid production. And so increased acid production and increased temperature allow hemoglobin to more easily give up its oxygen to the working muscles so that the working muscles can use that oxygen to produce ATP aerobically. And then we get carbon dioxide and water as a byproduct of that. So in addition, those are the two primary drivers, increased temperature or um, increased partial pressure of carbon dioxide, sorry, increased temperature, increased acidity. But another thing that affects it is increased partial pressure of carbon dioxide. Um, and then there's another, another compound, um, 2,3-DPG, which is related to um, glycolysis, but we won't get into that. So those are the two big things to know for now. Increase temperature, increase acidity, make it easier for hemoglobin to offload its oxygen to the muscles so that we don't have to produce as much energy anaerobically. All right, so ventilatory control works a lot like what we talked about with control of heart rate. So ventilatory control, remember when we're talking about ventilation, we're talking about breathing, we're talking about air movement. So how do we decide how many times per minute we need to breathe? Because we talked about in part one that at rest you breathe 12 times per minute. And then as you get into exercise, it can be you know, more than 30 times a minute, potentially more than 60 times a minute in your elite athletes. And so what, what happens to cause that? And just like what we talked about with, the, um, with control of heart rate, there is both a feed forward and a feedback system. And so in looking at this picture, so remember our primary motor cortex from uh, test two. So remember your primary motor cortex is where you initiate voluntary muscle actions. So um, the primary motor cortex is going to synapse there um, in the brainstem. And so it acts as that feed forward system. So when we're about to initiate exercise, our respiration, or not sorry, not respiration, our ventilation um, will increase 
in anticipation of the exercise. Remember we talked about the same thing with heart rate, that if you stood over a treadmill and you were speeding up the belt and you were just kind of standing on those side rails, you hadn't started exercising yet, but you were about to, that your heart rate would go up. Same kind of thing in terms of ventilation, in terms of how often you breathe. So if you're planning to exercise or if you're about to have to run, because you know this is, this is sympathetic driven, um, so this is fight or flight response here. If you're scared, those kinds of things, your ventilation, your breathing rate is going to go up. So um, other things there, so that's the feed forward system. So the motor cortex is in anticipation of exercise. We're gonna increase breathing rate. And then the feedback systems. So you've got chemoreceptors. Um, you can see here uh, in the left and right uh, carotid arteries. And then you've also got them here in this arch of the aorta. And so those chemoreceptors monitor a couple things. So they're gonna monitor the partial pressure of oxygen and then the partial pressure of carbon dioxide. So if, let's look at it this way, the partial pressure of oxygen doesn't normally decrease during exercise. So it, it stays pretty constant. If you're exercising at sea level, you're, or close to it, so white water is, the elevation's like 700 feet or something to that effect, it's not very high. Um, if you're exercising around here, which is basically at sea level, then your hemoglobin should be basically fully saturated. So somewhere around 98% saturation. If you go to altitude, and we'll talk more about that in a second, but if you go to altitude, then that saturation rate drops. And that's because of a drop in atmospheric pressure. So during exercise, under normal conditions, assuming that you're not at altitude and that your lungs work normally, that you don't have any sort of lung disease or anything like that, then the partial pressure of oxygen isn't gonna drop. But what does happen is that the partial pressure of carbon dioxide is gonna increase. So as, as the muscles are working harder, as they're running through more ATP and producing more, they're gonna produce more carbon dioxide. And so with that, the partial pressure of oxygen is gonna go up, or, or sorry, of carbon dioxide is gonna go up. And so that is going to stimulate an increase in breathing rate. Um, another thing that'll increase maybe a little bit, and this one's pretty marginal, but an increase in temperature can have an effect uh, in terms of increasing breathing rate as well. And so uh, we talked about receptors in the uh, hypothalamus that would be responsible for that. So back to carbon dioxide though. So one of the important things to know is that um, the partial pressure of carbon dioxide in your arterial plasma is the most important respiratory stimulus at rest. So um, the buildup of carbon dioxide is what's going to cause you to breathe. So one of the ways, or yeah, one of the ways that you, we know that is if you um, take a big deep breath and hold it. Usually, most people have to breathe again around 30 or 45 seconds. Um, it's pretty pretty average. Um, but what causes that desire to breathe is actually the accumulation of carbon dioxide. So one of the ways that you can get around that is to hyperventilate. And so if you, you take really shallow, rapid breaths before you hold your breath, you're gonna blow off a bunch of carbon dioxide. Um, and so in doing that, you're gonna make the blood more basic. And so as you make the blood more basic, then you have a little more wiggle room. And so then if you hyperventilate first and then take a big deep breath, you'll be able to hold your breath for a little bit longer. Um, and so what you've done is lowered the carbon lowered the partial pressure of carbon dioxide before you initiate the breath holding. And so it takes a little bit longer for it to build up, takes longer for it to cause you uh, the desire to breathe again. We'll skip over the receptors in lung tissue for now. We'll come back to those in a second. Um, so the proprioceptors in uh, the joints and muscle spindles. So as you move, that's again feedback that uh, I must be moving and so therefore energy costs must have gone up. And so therefore, I not only have to increase heart rate, but I also have to increase ventilation rate. So that will cause us to um, increase how often we breathe. There are some interesting studies, I think these are from the 60s, where they um, looked at rats and they passively move their limbs. So they, they move their little arms and legs, or I guess they have four legs. They move their legs for them passively. So it wouldn't have required any energy. Um, but just that passive movement or electrical stimulation, so they weren't doing it, but, but uh, the electricity is causing the muscles to contract, either of those things cause an increase in breathing rate. So there must be some sort of a feedback system from the joint capsules and from the muscle spindles as well. So as mentioned, an increase in core temperature, 
to some extent may cause an increase in uh, breathing rate, definitely gonna cause an increase in heart rate. Um, and then in terms of the chemical state of the blood, so as the blood gets more acidic, then that is also going to increase breathing rate. Where the receptors in lung tissue come in, they play a really important role there, primarily around the bronchioles, um, but they play a really important role in expiration. So basically, you're gonna breathe in until you've stretched out, until you've inflated the bronchioles enough, in which case you're gonna get uh, inhibitory feedback from those receptors in the bronchioles, which will then cause relaxation of the diaphragm and the other respiratory muscles and so then you breathe out. So the, the receptors in lung tissue play an important role essentially in initiating exhalation or uh, expiration, breathing out. All right, so because we got to work in history somehow, so my question for you is, um, so the 1968 Olympic Games, the summer games, were held in Mexico City. And so at that games, as you can see there, times improved for all races 800 meters or shorter and performances also improved in field events. The most notable improvement, you can see the picture of Bob Beeman there in the lower left. So he set a world record in the long jump that would stand for 22 years. He jumped 29.2 feet. Um, and so this is actually only the third Olympic Games to be televised. So the, the first Olympic Games to be televised was the 1960 Games in Rome. And one of the interesting things was that for the long jump, they had set up this new experimental camera that was uh, on a track next to the long jump pit. And so it's it's like you see now um, where the camera goes alongside the athlete. So as Beeman was running al um, on the runway, um, the camera would be going alongside him and then he jumped. And so the camera is still on that track, you know, keeping the same pace as him. He jumped so far that the camera fell off its track. They hadn't built the track long enough for, for a jump like that. Um, so it was a, a pretty incredible feat. They weren't even prepared to uh, televise that to really capture it on film. So incredible performance. But the question is, um, why would all of these events, 800 meters or shorter, the field events, so the long jump, but also things like the shot put, the hammer throw, the discus, etc., why would all of those things improve from the previous games? Well, an important thing to know, of course, is where is the previous games? So the 1964 Summer Games were at Tokyo. So Tokyo's elevation is 60 feet or less above sea level. So Tokyo is basically at sea level. As opposed to Mexico City has a really high elevation, actually in, term, in uh, elevation terms, actually moderate uh, or medium elevation, but it is 7,300 feet above sea level. So another 2,000 feet higher than Denver. So you're pretty far up there when you're in Mexico City. And so effectively what happens then is as you go up in altitude, so remember there's less atmosphere above you, there's, there's less, uh, the air weighs less is a way of thinking about it, right? So, so barometric or atmospheric pressure goes down because that column of air between you and the top of the atmosphere is not quite as tall because you have physically moved closer to the top of the atmosphere. So the air pressure has gone down and so the result of that is there's less of a driving force pushing oxygen into your lungs. And so as that happens, so the um, partial pressure of oxygen in that alveolar air would drop quite a bit and so your hemoglobin, rather than being 98% saturated, might only be something like 90% saturated. And so that's a big makes a big difference from a performance standpoint. So if you're running um, for you know two miles or 5K or any of those longer distance events that require a significant amount of endurance, um, you simply can't deliver as much oxygen to the tissues because there's less driving force, there's less pressure pushing oxygen into the blood, and so the hemoglobin is not fully saturated, and because of that, you can't deliver as much oxygen to the tissues, and because of that, you can't produce as much energy aerobically, and so performance declines. So for any event that is um, essentially longer than two minutes, there's a really significant aerobic component to that. They're very dependent upon the ability to deliver oxygen, and if your ability to do so is hampered by a reduction in air pressure, well then, your performance is gonna decline. But another thing to consider is that as, as that air pressure goes down, the way that that's oftentimes described is that the air is thinner. And so, to some extent, that is true in a way. Um, and so you get a reduction in air resistance. So you, obviously, while you're, when you're throwing something, when you're running, et cetera, um, you have to cut through the wind. That's a fluid force that you have to cut through and or move through. And so if the air is less dense, 
then it's easier to move through that through that air. I was going to say through that fluid, which it, when you get to biomechanics, you'll talk about uh, air as a fluid. But um, but yeah, so there's there's less resistance to your movement through that air. And so if you are doing a sprint or if you're throwing something, that decreased air resistance can make a huge difference in your performance. And so that's one of the things that played into Bob Beeman's exceptional jump there in the lower left is that that decreased air resistance allowed him to stay afloat for longer. There's less um, less turbulence, less pushing against him. And so helped him stay up in the air for a little bit longer and set that um, world record of 29.2 feet. The picture there in the lower right also comes from the 1968 games. It's probably the most iconic picture from the games. And so the, the uh, athlete who is in first place there is Tommy Smith. And he is the winner of, or was the winner of the 200 meter dash and set a world record time at that point of 19.83 seconds. And then in third there is a gentleman named John Carlos. Um, and so that was a really iconic picture of protest at the games um, that if you ever look up the 68 games, that's usually the first picture that pops up. All right, so what happens when we go to altitude? So remember, or as I was just saying, so as you get closer to the top of the atmosphere, there's less pressure. So Denver mathed it out a while back. And so the uh, partial pressure of oxygen uh, is 132 millimeters of mercury, again, as opposed to 159 millimeters of mercury at sea level. So that reduction in pressure causes less oxygenation. So how does the body respond? So if you were to fly to Denver um, one afternoon or fly to Mexico City one afternoon, how would the body respond? Well, if your hemoglobin is not fully saturated, the immediate responses of the body are to breathe faster. So that's hyperventilation. So your respiration rate will increase from 12 times a minute to something more like 14, maybe 15 times a minute. And so the reason that the body is doing that, it, it doesn't, the body isn't logical per se, but the basic logic of the body is that, well, if the hemoglobin isn't fully saturated, if it's only, let's say 95%, 94% saturated, then what I can do is circulate that blood a little bit faster. And so that'll offset the decrease in oxygenation of the blood. Um, and so in, in terms of circulating it faster, that's where we see that increase in heart rate and increase in blood pressure. So you're going to get a sympathetic response to that um, decrease in oxygenation of the blood. And then the hyperventilation is you're basically going to try to breathe faster to uh, saturate the blood. But if you live at altitude or if you sleep in an altitude tent or chamber, um, so you, know, you spend more than 10 hours a day at altitude, then you're gonna get some longer term adaptation. So rather than just the hyperventilation and increase in heart rate, eventually you're gonna get more capillaries. So you'll get capillaries around uh, or in muscle tissue. In addition to that, you, skeletal muscle tissue in that case, you're gonna get um, more myoglobin in that tissue. So remember that myoglobin basically acts as a shuttle bus. It takes oxygen from the bloodstream to the mitochondria inside of the muscle cell. And then we're gonna get more mitochondria, which is where we use that oxygen. And so all of those adaptations there, more capillaries, more myoglobin, more mitochondria, those are the same adaptations that we see in response to um, endurance exercise. So it's sort of the body kind of becomes endurance trained by living at altitude. The other things that you're going to see, um, so a reduction in mass, um, you're going to get with that altitude and with that, uh, those, particularly those initial uh, sympathetic responses, you're going to get an increase in your basal metabolic rate, which again is the calories that you burn just sitting around, and a decrease in appetite. So one of the things when people live at altitude, um, like all the time, is that they tend to have a little bit lower weight, um, and because of a, a decreased appetite, and it can re result in reductions in not only fat mass, but also in muscle mass as well. And then another adaptation that we're going to see in response to altitude is an increase in the number of red blood cells. So if your hemoglobin is only 95% saturated or 90% saturated, depending upon the altitude, then the body just makes more red blood cells. And so that way you've got more of them that are partially full. And so if somebody then lives at altitude, or at least let's, um, if somebody, let's say, sleeps in an altitude chamber, so they actually um, have a tent or a chamber 
And you see this like sometimes in Tour de France riders or really elite endurance athletes. They'll sleep in an altitude chamber. And so what that does, that, that reduction in the atmospheric pressure and the partial pressure of oxygen for those 10 hours while you're in that chamber tricks the body into thinking that it's at altitude. And so then you get these longer term adjustments. You get more capillaries, more myoglobin, more mitochondria, and also more red blood cells. And so then when they leave the chamber, when they wake up in the morning and climb out of there and they go train, they have increased the adaptations that they would have made to training in the first place, right? Um, and so we talked in the blood chapter about the about blood doping and the importance of additional red blood cells, that that helps you carry more oxygen. So this is just a uh, quote unquote natural way to do it rather than um, either centrifuging your own blood or taking EPO, the hormone that causes you to produce more red blood cells. So um, this is one of the ways that athletes do it that's legal Again, the results are, are similar, right? Both of them result in uh, more red blood cells, but one of them is allowed and one of them is not. So ideally, what an athlete would do would be to live high and train low. And the reason for that is if you live at altitude or sleep there, um, then you're gonna get all those adaptations that we talked about. But if you train at altitude, even with those adaptations, you're still not gonna be able to train at the same intensity as you would at sea level because even with those adaptations, you still can't deliver quite as much oxygen to the working muscles as you would be able to at a lower elevation. And so as a result of it, um, training intensity declines at altitude. So ideally, what one would do would be to live at altitude, make all these adaptations, and then train at sea level, so drive down the mountain for your training, so that you can maintain the intensity of your training and also to minimize those reductions in lean mass that it can occur when you live at altitude. So that's why you see out athletes that sometimes either you know sleep in a, a tent or an altitude tent or an altitude chamber. The reason for that is um, because you can get those effects and then you don't have to move and you don't have to drive down the mountain. You can still maintain your training intensity and get these adaptations, particularly the more red blood cells that you're looking for. So the ideal is to live high and train low. Um, when I was at uh, I worked briefly at a physical therapy clinic in Austin that, that worked with a lot of um, higher level athletes, particularly runners and triathletes. And we had a guy that came in all the time who was a pretty elite level runner. And he lived in Albuquerque or the Albuquerque area. And so basically what he did was he lived um, way up in the mountains or as high as he could get. And then all of his training, he would do just that. He would drive out of the mountains for a really long time to get as low as he could and then do his training um, at the, the lowest elevation he could find and then drive right back up to his house, um, again, to, to capitalize on that live high, train low thing. And then the last thing I have on here, so this actually comes from uh, Australia, but that's okay. So one of the things, um, you know, we've all had those, the fire safety in like elementary school and stuff, and, and remember that one of the things that they talk about that, that you have to do or that you should do in order to survive a fire is exactly what that little green thing, I don't know what he is, uh, what he's describing to or telling everybody to do, which is to get down low and then go, 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 right? And so the idea is that if you stand up, then you are gonna breathe in more carbon monoxide. And the reason that that's important is that carbon monoxide, um, that hemoglobin has a really high affinity for carbon monoxide. So in fact, hemoglobin's uh, affinity for carbon, di or carbon monoxide, sorry, is 200 times higher than it is for oxygen. So effectively what happens then is if you're breathing air that has a lot of carbon monoxide in it, that displaces, that binds to the hemoglobin. And so then you've got one less spot for oxygen to bind to, and so it's gonna be displaced. And so it reduces the oxygen carrying capacity of the blood by displacing it, by blocking the um, heme sites um, where oxygen would have bound to. So that's why that advice is a thing. All right, so that's it for chapter 22. So then next time we'll move on to chapter 23, the digestive system. And as promised, this was only 39 minutes, so not quite as long as the last one. So we'll see you next time.